I'm pleased to introduce our first presenter, who sits on the advisory committee of the Wallace Center's Pasture Project. Laura Payne has done grazing research, education, and market development for 20 years. She previously conducted on-farm grazing research at the University of Wisconsin and served as county extension agent in Columbia County, Wisconsin. Since 2006, she has served as grazing and organic agriculture specialist for the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection, providing economic, business, and market development research and education, and one-on-one -on -one assistance to producers in developing and marketing uh, organic and grass-fed products. Laura and her husband Bill raise and direct grass uh, market. <laughs> sorry, raise and direct market grass-fed beef on their farm near Columbus, Wisconsin. Laura. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you very much, Jeff, for that introduction. And I'll jump right into my slides, as you can see, I've already done. Um, as a beef producer, and uh, because my uh, project does include uh, both beef and dairy, or meat, animals, and dairy. Um, you will see a few beef pictures in this slide presentation, but the, um, the thrust of it is really about the dairy, um, the grass-based dairy industry. So um, what I'm going to be covering today is um, general, uh, kind of a big picture of, of how managed grazing uh, for dairy producers really um, kind of carries out that triple bottom line, um, which is a, a concept that originated in, in industry, the idea that um, a business should be economically sound, environmentally uh, friendly, and also supportive of um, social uh, needs of our communi communities. And I believe that grass-based dairy does um, fall into all of those categories. I'd like to start with just a basic uh, definition so that we all are on the same page as to what we mean by management intensive grazing or managed grazing for, uh, for dairy cattle. Um, the, the basic concept behind management intensive grazing is that you're confining your herd of cattle into a small uh, section of the pasture system called a paddock and you're moving the animals uh, frequently uh, from one paddock to another so that, as you can see on the right side in the diagram, if you've got a system of 30 paddocks at any one time, um, most of the pasture is not being grazed and is allowed to rest for up to 29 days. Um, at the other end of the continuum, you have a set stocking situation where um, the productivity and the quality is quite low. Um, the farther you get toward the high, highly intensive management, the higher forage quality and uh, forage yield you get. We do have, um, in Wisconsin, we have about over 3,000 dairy farmers who use management intensive grazing. About a quarter of our dairy farms uh, use this. And some of the best managers are moving their cattle ev after every milking to a new paddock. So it's a very flexible system that can be adjusted anywhere along that continuum and it um, is very easy to adapt to just about any system that a farmer already has. So that's what managed grazing is. Um, the reason why uh, many producers are moving to it is the economics of the system. And these uh, graphs show um, actual figures from a research project that's been going on for more than a decade collecting uh, economic data from cost of production data from uh, farms in Wisconsin and across the Great Lakes region. As you can see in the graphs, uh, generally what the, the basic concept behind managed grazing is reducing cost of production in terms of uh, letting the animals uh, harvest their own feed, spread their own manure, uh, reducing the cost of um, infrastructure and equipment needs feed costs and that sort of thing. And, and the point here really is that the, um, while the grazing farm on a per cow basis is producing less milk, each cow is, is generating more net income because the cost of production is lower. And as you can see from this graph, the confinement farm 
would need to have four times as many cows just to make as much profit as the grazing farm would because of the difference in the amount of profit. So one of our questions uh, in the work that I'm doing now is can we uh, build a market for grass-based products as an artisan or specialty dairy product that can encourage more uh, grazers, more farmers to uh, go into grazing. Okay, I'd like to just spend a few slides talking about the environmental benefits of managed grazing. And we've done quite a bit of research here in Wisconsin, and there's been research that's been done um, in other areas as well that support this. Um, this slide shows um, looking at uh, soil erosion reductions. Uh, the Discovery Farms program in Wisconsin is some on-farm research that's uh, being done on a variety of different farming systems. The graph shows uh, three different farming systems. Uh, the large red bar is represents the row crop system and the amount of uh, runoff and soil erosion that was recorded from row cropping farms. Um, the pink or kind of purple bar is a dairy cropping system. And then those bars that you really can't see very well is the runoff that they recorded from the uh, pastures on one of our grazing farms. And as you can see, the, um, the orange bar is actually the predicted or the modeled uh, runoff. And the runoff from these pastures was actually even less than that. So that's a, a good indication that wherever we can put more pastures on the landscape, we're going to have a reduction in soil erosion runoff and um, runoff of the accompanying nutrients. We've also done a lot of work on looking at pastures as wildlife habitat. Um, and uh, this graph shows uh, declines in one of the most uh, endangered uh, group of species, and that is uh, the grassland birds, the ground nesting birds that were adapted to the prairies that once existed in the Midwest. Um, since the, these prairies are um, created some of the uh, richest soils in the country. Those soils have been very heavily used for, for cropping. And as a consequence, uh, a lot of these species have declined pretty precipitously. And the, the, this red uh, line on the, on the graph is an indication of, the, of one species. Uh, the point I'd like to make here is that um, this decline uh, became more steep as our farming systems in this re region moved from a forage-based system, which is the blue line, uh, acreages of uh, forages, um, also declining, and moved toward one that was based more on annual row crops, as in the, um, oops, sorry about that, um, in this green line here. Um, so one of our thoughts here is that um, Livestock-based systems, whether they are hay-based or pasture-based, provide a lot more acres of habitat for these birds. And we also find that um, a lot of research has shown that these species are adapted to a grazed habitat, a habitat that has variable structure. It uh, doesn't matter as much what the grasses are that are planted, but as you can see in this picture of the six or eight uh, bird species that are recorded in the study, most of them are found in areas that are grazed um, all the way down to four inches and up to 12 inches or so. And there's actually the idle habitats, um, like a CRP field or something like that, have fewer species um, and fewer um, individual birds. Um, so this is an indication that our, our grazing systems are very compatible with wildlife and um, the private lands that are used for grazing provide good, um, good habitat. We have a couple of publications, and I'll, there's a um, link to these at the end of the presentation. Uh, these are based on the research that we did here in the state, and they're farmer-friendly uh, publications, um, kind of a how-to type thing on how to manage to uh, promote the environmental 
benefits that we see in managed grazing. Okay, so we feel that well-managed grazing systems can be part of the solution, controlling soil erosion, protecting water quality, and providing that wildlife habitat. And I guess the next um, thought that we had and what I've been working on recently is can we use um, this market development side of things to foster the conservation that we know we can achieve with managed grazing systems. So the rest of my presentation will be really focusing on that uh, side of things. So the, the program that I started back in 2006 and that we've been working on for several years is um, trying to connect um, the farmer, the producer, who um, is great at the production side of things and managing their farms that don't necessarily know a lot about what happens to their product after it leaves the farm gate. Um, so we're looking at um, can we shorten that supply chain and give them the opportunity to market their product either as a unique uh, farm fed type product or can they perhaps work together in the smaller scale cooperatives to provide uh, um, a local food and to access some of these premium markets that we know are out there. We've looked at um, how big the market is for grass-fed foods, and there's a, not a lot of information available in terms of like consumer preference uh, surveys and that sort of thing. There's a little bit more on the beef side than there is on the dairy, but we don't really have a profile of who the grass-fed buyer is. So the next uh, possible thing that we can do is kind of look at related foods and what, what kind of buyers are buying organic, natural, and local foods. And they're mo the most likely people to be interested in uh, grass-based products. So what are the things that motivate them? Um, they're motivated by health concerns. They're motivated by environmental concerns, which means that our um, managed grazing should fit right into um, both of those topics. Um, specialty and artisan shoppers are another uh, category of, of buyers, people who are um, for whom flavor and quality is important, people for whom the story of the product is important. So we've looked in the Midwest at um, where those types of uh, consumers are, and we've got uh, several urban centers, uh, Minneapolis area, Madison, Milwaukee, and Chicago. Um, that are kind of targets um, for uh, consumers that might be interested in these products. And then we're looking at uh, doing some, we're actually doing some research looking at the, the unique characteristics of grass-based products. From the um, small startups that we have, we know that the, the local food story is, resonates with buyers and we know that the um, environmental benefits resonate. Uh, but what we found with dairy is that there are really significant uh, chemistry and physical differences in the milk, which we think can help establish grass-fed milk as a specialty ingredient. So in, in these uh, two pictures, the one on the left is a vat of uh, milk from pastured cows. The one on the right is a vat of milk from cows fed as a stored feed diet. You can even see the difference. You can see the beta carotene and the, the yellow color of the, uh, the milk in the vats. So the questions that we want to ask is, what makes that milk different? Um, what do consumers like? Um, we found that the, the milk not only looks different, but it has a different flavor and a different texture. Um, what products are the best fit for the flavor? Um, of that milk and the texture. Um, we are working with some uh, chefs to look at the culinary performance of the products and, and how, how they uh, perform in different foods. Uh, we've kind of focused the research on um, a lot on the butter because um, a lot of these differences are um, concentrated in the butter fat. And when you taste uh, grass-based butter versus conventional butter, you can and feel and smell and taste the difference. So 
uh, our chefs are kind of helping us define what products work really well with this uh, product with this grant-based milk and what which ones are not the best fit. And then we're looking at a market assessment um, to tell us whether there's enough interest in the processing industry to um, go forward with a, a grass-fed milk pool. So, um, you know, maybe there are processors who are interested in working with this uh, specialized milk, just like there are some processors looking at uh, working with goat milk or sheep milk in their products. So those are kind of the questions that we've been asking. And then the the concept here is kind of looking at the idea of terroir, which is a um, a term that the French originated in talking about their wines and the the wines that are um, in particular areas of of the country, the climate the plants and the soil uh, all combine to create particular flavors. And they're, they're currently working over in France on doing the same thing with their cheeses. And I think, I think this is something that we in the, um, especially in the, the Great Lakes region where we have a history of um, dairy, we can think about doing the same. So the research that we're doing um, is trying to kind of foster that uh, notion of terroir. Uh, we're looking at, um, we're developing some comparisons between the grass-fed and the conventional stored seeds in terms of milk qualities. We're looking at the seasonality of the pasture and how that affects the, the product. And then um, this publication that's right in the middle of the slide is a series of case histories of grass-based dairy uh, marketing efforts um, by individual farms and groups of farms to kind of um, create a foundation for building this industry. So here's some examples. Um, most of the successes we've seen to date have been uh, these farmstead uh, scale uh, cheese efforts, um, which is single farm. The milk is very consistent because it comes from the same farm and the in this case, uh, Mike Gingrich is the cheesemaker at this uh, company that's near Dodgeville, Wisconsin. Um, he did his own research um, looking at alpine cheeses. Um, he created his own recipe, and it's been a, a very um, successful uh, product on the market that sells for about $25 a pound, and he can't make enough of it. So this is a, a success story. Um, we also have some groups that are scaling up, and this is this is where I have a lot of interest in in helping um, groups of dairy farmers uh, organize themselves to market their milk or to build businesses where they can uh, share the marketing expertise and share the processing, because this will have the ability to impact a lot more farmers, obviously. So whether you're in an area like Wisconsin where we have a lot of dairy infrastructure or maybe you're in an area of the country where there isn't a lot of dairy infrastructure left, uh, we all used to have small-scale regional or local dairy processing uh, back in the old days. Um, and I think it's possible to recreate that even if you're in an area where you don't have it. Um, Missouri is an example of where they're, they're working on this and they're attracting um, new dairy farms and new processing. Um, the reason why this is a great idea is um, uh, listed on this slide, um, going back to the very beginning of my talk, a pasture-based dairy farm can generate um, a good net income on a relatively small acreage uh, compared to a cash grain farm or uh, something like that. 60 to 100 cows can provide a comfortable living for a farm family uh, without hiring a lot of labor or without a huge invest investment in income. And these are farms that are compatible with urban development that can be um, right up against a town or a residential area um, in contrast with uh, manure storage or something like that. These are cows out on pasture. Um, they're very compatible with 
um, non-farming development. Some research that was done at the University of Wisconsin suggests that um, more than almost any other kind of farming, a dairy farm generates a lot of economic activity and um, circulation of dollars among businesses in a local community. In fact, we find that for every cow, every dairy cow in Wisconsin, about $15,000 to $17,000 in economic activity occur per year. And this is, you know, purchases at the local feed mill, purchases at the local hardware store, uh, the, the processing side of things. Um, it, it creates economic activity for a community. And then, you know, finally, dairy processing can provide jobs and generate revenue for rural communities as well. So how are we fostering uh, this growth in Wisconsin? Well, we have a, a number of activities here in the state, and then there are also some nationally available um, uh, resources that I'll get to in a few minutes. But um, in Wisconsin, we have two groups. We have the Grow Wisconsin Dairy Team, which um, is made up of uh, state agencies and uh, UW Extension and the College of Agriculture. And they focus on uh, mainly technical assistance and education. Uh, we do have some grants and tax credits that are available. We also have the Dairy Business Innovation Center, which is a, a group of consultants um, that uh, bring together for uh, food artisan uh, the business planning piece, the, what equipment they need. They work with them on marketing. They work with them on label development to help launch some of these um, new businesses. And there's funding as well um, that you're probably aware of uh, from the USDA, the Value Added Producer Grant Program, the Farmers Market Promotion Program, um, and within uh, the states. Um, here in Wisconsin, at least, we have a number of uh, sources of funding to get some of these projects off the, off the ground. And then additional tools that uh, some of our folks here in the state have looked at using um, are listed here on this slide. Uh, one of them is, a, is just a publication that kind of lists out uh, resources for uh, food businesses in Wisconsin, and it, that uh, publication called Got Moolah has um, Wisconsin and national sources of uh, funding and expertise and technical assistance. University Extension um, on the business development side can help us uh, get some of these things off the ground. And then, you know, maybe there are some local economic development resources that we can think about using, like um, tax incremental financing or revolving loan funds um, that would be appropriate for these food-based um, industries. And finally, uh, private investment possibilities. Uh, flow money is a um, national movement that um, many areas have access to that uh, might be a good, good source of funding to get some of these things started. Okay, and then finally, um, I just wanted to list out the sources for some of the information that I shared today. Um, the first one here is uh, the source of a number of uh, good managed grazing uh, extension uh, materials, including the ones on grassland birds and uh, grazing streamside pastures. Uh, this is the the second one is this um, the location of our grass-based dairy marketing. Uh, case histories. We've got a video out on the research project that you can take a look at. And then the Grow Wisconsin Dairy Initiative and the Dairy Business Innovation Center uh, websites are there. Uh, our Dairy Artisan Network and then the impact of agriculture, economic impact of agriculture is the last uh, one. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Joe. Um, the idea here being that you know, we've got uh, good economic development opportunities here in grass-based dairy, and Joe is going to be covering um, how he and his family um, have managed their farm very um, profitably and how he's helping others get into the dairy industry. 
Thank you, Laura. Um, let me uh, let me introduce Joe. Also, uh, um, I wanted to note that I've put all of those resources um, that uh, that you have in the, the on the previous slide up on the uh, webinar webinar archived page uh, for for this webinar. Um, the recording obviously is not there yet, um, but uh, but the page is up. Um, so those links are are live. So let me. Uh, introduce Joe Tomandel and uh, Joe and his wife Christy own and operate a seasonal grass-based dairy in north central Wisconsin. The Tomandels purchased the original 35 cows and 80 acre farm in 1998 after short careers as agricultural instructors. It was their desire to raise their children in the country and manage grazing that lured them, lured them back to the farm. The past 14 years have brought numerous changes in cow management and facilities. The current farm consists of 170 seasonal milking cows and young stock on 320 acres of pasture. In 2010, the second 200-acre, 170 cow farm was added and is, becoming, is being operated by a longtime employee. Joe has been involved in the dairy grazing movement since he began farming. He's a past president of Grassworks, involved in grazing networks, state planning committees, and in efforts to add value to grass-based milk products. He is genuinely committed to the education and success of other startup dairy farmers, and managed grazing uh, has it proven to be the model that can put more farmers on the land. Joe? Thank you. Thanks so much for that introduction and, uh, and providing this forum. This is just a really uh, nice forum uh, you know, that, that people can have access to. So it's great to see. Uh, and also, thank you to uh, Laura also. We're real fortunate in Wisconsin to have uh, Laura in the position that she's in. Uh, she's just a real great resource and, and does a fantastic job um, in, in helping promote um, you know, foods and, and value added uh, and the grazing industry. Uh, so thanks so much for her and for all of her work that she's done. Uh, I'm the farmer today. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just kind of go through, and, and Jeff had asked me to talk about the farm, how we got started in it, uh, and uh, you know, in, in, in how we manage it, and then kind of how it's grown, you know, throughout the number of years, uh, and then from there we'll talk about a newer program that we've got going here in the state, which is the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program. Oh, my slides are popping ahead a little bit. Uh, and like we had said, Jeff had mentioned the biography. Uh, my wife and I, uh, we both grew up on dairy farms. My wife grew up on a nice little conventional uh, family farm. Uh, her folks are still farming. I grew up on another family farm, different part of the state, uh, on a grazing type of farm. We had my dad, my mom and dad had converted to grazing oh, in the mid to late 80s or so. So I was fairly familiar uh, with grazing and the benefits and what it had to offer. Uh, and especially what it had to offer, not only from, from an environmental, economic standpoint, but also from a family a life and family type of a standpoint. Uh, so uh, my wife and I were egg instructors, and we had always thought about coming back to the farm. And in 1998, a farm did come up for sale in my neighborhood, uh, and it was a modest farm. And that's kind of what the first picture is here. This is you know the farm that we purchased. The barn had not seen cows in, I think, probably five, six years, and, and again, a, a modest farmhouse. Uh, and there was 80 acres, and this was the farm we wanted, you know, because it was managed grazing that we really wanted to do, and, you know, we didn't want to go with a real lot of infrastructure and overhead. Uh, so, you know, we were able to source about 35 cows. I had a few at my dad's place, and, and my wife's dad uh, sent uh, another half a dozen cows over. Uh, so we began, began with about 35 or 40 cows, and our, our intent was basically just to, uh, to get this farm going, to use the facilities that we had, and again, they were they were nothing real fancy. This is the original stanchions and stuff that were in this barn uh, that we had utilized. We put a pipeline in here and, and made it work. And our intent was to do this, uh, you know, for as long as this barn would let us do it. And during that time, just to look at all the different uh, grazing systems uh, that were out there and determine which kind of direction we wanted to go. Because with managed grazing, there isn't one specific way to do it. Uh, there's just a whole variety of different types of ways to implement managed grazing. And they can be anything from a uh, family farm that milks year-round with about 40 or 50 cows uh, all the way to these two and 300 cow seasonal dairies, which just freshen uh, cows in the springtime. And then there's all sorts of them in between. 
Uh, so we just kind of wanted to get as much information as we could uh, during this time and, and figure out what direction we wanted to go. So fortunately, Wisconsin, we've got quite a few different grazing networks. There were a lot of pasture walks that were being hosted. Uh, Grassworks was in the state, and they had a state grazing conference, and there were a number of little regional conferences around. So you know, we got to learn as much as we could and network with as many farmers as we could. Uh, and, and after a couple of years, you know, our barn really did kind of exhaust itself where it was time we needed to do something. Uh, and through looking at different things, you know, we had decided, you know, the direction we want to go to is more of a seasonal type of a grass-based dairy. Uh, and in that, looking at that, oh, that 80 to 100 plus cows, try and do a one-person type of a setup. Uh, so in uh, year 2000, this is a couple years after it was done, we took the old barn and uh, used some plants in the University of Wisconsin and, and some help through the extension and that, and designed and built just a very simple swing parlor. Uh, and this is a swing 16, all built out of two-inch tube steel that we welded together uh, and used use milking equipment, and we put it in so that we could simply milk more cows uh, and a little bit more quicker and more efficiently. And we decided to do this rather than, you know, redo the whole inside of the stall barn. Uh, you know, the, the cost of doing this wasn't a whole lot more, and it just gave us a lot more capacity. So, and then why did we choose seasonal? Well, one of the reasons uh, is because we didn't have to invest a huge amount of money in other infrastructure. Uh, you know, this picture is, oh, it's taken a little bit later, but there's probably about 120 cows out there or so. Uh, but by doing a seasonal type of an operation, uh, we didn't have to build great big barns uh, and, and, and holding areas and feed storage and everything else. Uh, we're actually able to use a lot of the natural structure around our farm uh, and windbreaks and bedded packs, and we outwintered. Uh, the majority of these animals, and that simply you can do that if they're all, you know, freshening in April and May, and then we're bringing basically late lactation and dry cows through. Uh, so that was a, it was a that year had its challenges. You know, we're still trying to you know get this whole farming thing figured out, and then we're changing our management system. Uh, so we're going from something where you've got the cows, you know, you're right up close and personal with the cows twice a day, so you can you know, uh, do any, you know, health checks on them or anything else like that uh, to a system where we've got a few more cows and, you know, you're not right close and personal with them every day. So you need to figure out different systems of management. And the whole time uh, getting them out on grass and, and continuing moving them. Uh, so as our cow numbers uh, grew, we were at about 80 or 100 cows at that time. That's around that year 2000. Um, and, and through 2002, just kind of getting things figured out. Uh, you know, when we started looking at more animals, we did need to upgrade some of our infrastructure, and that would be some of our lanes. Uh, we reinforced more of those, uh, and then we did put in bigger water lines throughout into the paddocks also. And this is, a, this is actually an inch and a half water line uh, that we're plugging into right here on 300-gallon tanks, a bunch of the heifers behind us at this point. Uh, so we did make some of those type of investments uh, as, as we grew with the cow numbers. Because, you know, there is, you know, we did find out there is a, there's a big difference between 35 or 40 cows and, and 110 cows. You know, you know, some things are almost ex, exponentially different uh, when it comes to some of your management, some of your needs, and that. Um, so anyway, this is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm hoping we aren't hearing too many um, audio problems here. Uh, Okay, I think we've got things figured out. Um, but anyway, uh, in doing that, uh, you know, we we had continued growing, you know, with the farm, uh, and uh, and things were going pretty well. Around that time, also, uh, is there was some more land that did start coming up for rent, and this is actually land right in the back end of our original 80-acre farm. And we did have a few more cows at that time. And when you look at this chunk of land, this is, right now, this black cow is about three-quarters of a mile from our actual parlor. Uh, so when this 50 or 100 acres of, of land comes up, you know, we can look at this and say, all right, we can do a number of things with this. I can either come in here 
and uh, you know till this land up and uh, pick rocks on it and uh, fertilize it and do everything I need to do and plant corn or beans or whatever else I need to do or plant hay or try and grow more forage on it uh, and then in the fall grab that forage harvest it haul it back to my barn and feed it to my cows or I could say you know what this poly wire works really good you know there is an exact system of lanes there but we can get those cows there so these cows now do all the cutting the harvesting they bring the milk back to me and they spread their own nutrients back on the ground uh, so that's obviously you know the philosophy that we're using here and that's what we chose to do so once you get a herd of cows that understand these fences and these grazing systems they're very easy to move so moving them across you know a, a part of a section is no big deal you know, we even move them through you know portions of, of wild pasture and almost uh, woods edges and, and rougher edges without hardly any fence uh, they just get things figured out uh, as we continue to move on I'm going to keep moving here typically this presentation a lot of times I have like 70 pictures in my presentation I could talk all day about uh, grazing and cows and things like that so I'm going to move a little bit quicker here uh, to get through this but uh, in 2007 or so one of our next best investments that we looked at was more of a covered feeding strip and you know a building for freshening cows you know we did have about 140 or 150 cows at that time uh, and this did become a good investment and we just used it a lot of times mainly just in the spring we we fed a little supplemental stuff in the uh, corn silage and that in the winter time uh, and that helped bring us through and actually it wasn't the winter as much that was important it was that springtime and those 30 degree kind of rainy days and stuff that helped us a lot so then as we kind of go through the year you know we get through that spring calves on the ground calves go right out also after they're raised in groups and weaned they're out on grass and pastures and we're able to move those with poly wire also also in the springtime it's pretty busy and we do a lot of no-tilling so we typically don't till conventionally till much at all we run around with a no-till drill and try to intercede in different legumes and grasses and it doesn't always look like this after we go through the no-till sometimes it can be a year before you see stuff in all reality uh, but this is just one instance where we had a more aggressive festivoleum on a paddock that had taken a little bit more pressure on the off season on the on the previous season where we fed some some stored feed and that and it really took nice it was just a nice example of of no tilling here and what we're able to do with that so yes yeah, spring does get a little, little bit busy and then what we're also doing in the springtime is we're harvesting excess forage because during that period of time grass grows so quickly we call it the grass explosion it grows so quickly that you cannot keep up to it with your cows so uh, we have to harvest some of that and most of that is done uh, by methods of round baling and making baleage out of it and wrapping it and then that way we can use it as extra supplemental feed if we need to or it's going to be that uh, feed for the winter time uh, and then you know once we get done with you know a lot of the baleage and a lot of that first crop and we get done AI and cows uh, that's usually happening right at the end of June and uh, we AI that first cycle through the cows and then after that we re we turn bulls in with them to clean everybody up uh, so once we get to actually about this time of the year uh, things do start slowing down a little bit it does get intense I won't kid you from you know that that middle of March through uh, through July here the early July uh, but um, it does start slowing down to a nice pace and a bit more of a routine and, and just getting cows out on that grass so right now and but you're you know well this picture I think was taken 2008 but this is what our farm currently looked like and it was about 100 uh, about 170 cows or so uh, and about 320 acres of grazable land and in you know in 2008 2009 you know things uh, were kind of settling in a little bit more and, and getting caught up and understanding this a little bit better and my wife and I talked you know what 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 is our next step you know what what do you do now you know are we've got the correct amount of acreage you know we're utilizing uh, a pretty efficient system in that we're getting about 70 percent for boy six months out of the year about 70 percent of the dry matter in our cows is coming from grass so we're stocked pretty proportionately to that 
And, uh, and you don't want to lose that efficiency and reduce the intake of grass down to 50% or 40% or 30%. So this is a good size. So how do you keep continuing in these continue investing in these grazing dairies? You know, and, and you know, one thing we thought about is, well, a conventional mindset would say, well, let's just throw another 150 cows here. And in doing that, we'd add another barn possibly. We'd remodel the milking facility. We could add on some more some bunker silos and feeding and commodity storage and a little bit more equipment and bring in some more feed. Uh, and in doing that, you know, have a whole bunch more capital that we invest in this little piece of land here. Uh, and pretty soon, uh, you know, we'd look at that and seven or eight years later is what we're seeing is the next step of investing would be to add more. Uh, so pretty soon when we're ready to cash out of this whole thing uh, and, and sell it and retire out of this, if we're not careful, we could have millions of dollars of infrastructure right in a small area all around our house. And it would be too big to turn over to the next generation uh, just because I mean, it may be worth millions of dollars. Uh, so one generation could, could maybe do pretty well on it. But who's your market? Who's going to buy that? And it's going to be another larger farm or a large landowner or a large uh, a cropping person. Uh, so we thought, you know, we don't want to go that way either because when we sell that, we probably sell the whole thing lock, stock, and barrel, including our house. Uh, it, you know, we just, that didn't seem like it was the right thing to do. So what's the alternative? We thought, you know, maybe what the alternative is, let's do this again. Uh, so we did. In, in 2010, there was a neighbor farm, about 200 acres, that came up, uh, and, and we did purchase it with the intent of duplicating our setup. Uh, so we took a, a, a basically, it was a 55 cow conventional type of a dairy, a nice little family farm, uh, and we had put, uh, retrofitted the barn and put a swing parlor in this one also, just to capture some you know, efficiencies. Uh, this one is a, it's nicer than the original one I started with, and some of the reason is because I spent, you know, 10 years in my parlor thinking about what I do different milking cows. So here's some of the results of it, uh, which had some costs. Uh, but the other thing is, you know, now I'm looking at creating a facility that's not an owner operator. It's something that I'm going to hire somebody to put on it and run. So we need to have a pretty decent facility in there too. Uh, so that's what we did. We created another, um, farm in 2007. So we've got another, it's 170 cow uh, grazing dairy, uh, which our longtime employee is now living on and kind of managing and operating over there. Uh, during that time also, we had put on, uh, you know, more cows before we had the barn built. We put on about another 120 cows. So that's our whole herd before we split them uh, in the fall of 2010 for the second facility was up uh, to get going. Uh, so that's kind of where we're sitting now. That leads us on to the next thing, and uh, and I hope that there's questions later too. And feel free, uh, don't be shy about asking. Uh, I'm I'm pretty open about how all this worked, whether it worked good or bad, or what did work good or, or didn't work well. But that leads us on to the next thing. You know, this whole idea about maybe two farms rather than one big one, or three farms rather than one big one. You know, the way to make this happen, and the reason why it would prevent a lot of people from doing it is not having access to the correct people. This is how it's going to be a success, is if we have the correct people running this farm. Uh, and, and that's key. That's, that's what's going to make it work. What we have going on right now in Wisconsin is it's a new initiative. It's an initiative of Grassworks, uh, and it's called the Dairy Grazing Apprenticeship Program. And basically, what the objective of this program is to train this next generation of farmers, not just an agronomist, not just a dairy nutritionist, uh, not just a veterinarian, somebody that can understand all aspects of a farm, and not only just any farm, but a grazing type of dairy, which is a, a real uh, biological type of a system. It's a moving system. So it takes experience to, to understand this. You can't learn this in a classroom. So we use, you know, to train people to do this, and knowing also that there's a lot of grazers that are out there that have got an incredible amount of knowledge at this, and we don't want to lose that. Uh, we said, you know, this formalized education program that's been in the state for 100 years and throughout the nation uh, of apprenticeship, which is what we've used to train skilled labor for, like say, for years. The plumbers, the electricians, you know, the bricklayers, they've all used it. So we said, hey, let's use that to train our next generation of dairymen, 
uh, dairy people. Uh, so our dairy grazing apprenticeship, I'm going to go through it quickly. It turned into a 4,000 hour, basically a two year uh, paid training where you're actually working on a farm. Uh, 3,712 hours actually are on the job training uh, where you're working on this grazing dairy. 288 are called paid related instruction. That's basically in class work. So, you know, and then, so that's, that's one of the objectives of this farm is to create that pathway to farm ownership and pathway to new farmers. Uh, the other half of this equation is to create that pathway to farm transfer. Average age of farmers is 55. Right now, what are their options to exiting the industry if they don't have a child or you know somebody in the family or a close person that's ready to take this thing over? What are their options? It's very difficult for people just to come in and buy these little dairies. And with the economics of everything, it's very difficult to take a 50 cow conventional type of a dairy and make it work economically if you're going to come in and buy it. So a lot of people, their only options right now are to sell it to a large landowner or you know, uh, another larger dairy. Uh, but we're saying, hey, I think we can have another option here. If we've got a skilled labor force, uh, skilled people that understand a managed grazing system that could come in and actually use managed grazing, which will work economically on your farm, this could be the other option for you. And we've got to believe, and we know there are, there's a lot of farmers out there that would love to see their farm stay a farm. So again, the program, I'm just going to skip over this real quickly. Uh, you know, we, we spent basically two years uh, working on the curriculum for this program. Uh, we formed a great relationship with the Department of Workforce Development, uh, brought in uh, uh, curriculum designers from worldwide in, uh, instructional design systems to help us out with this. We've got a job book created. Uh, the technical colleges uh, had altered some of their classes to fit into our type of curriculum. Uh, the UW uh, a short course is involved, the School for Green Dairy and Livestock Farmers. We really had a great partnerships that have come onto this to try and make this whole thing work. Uh, we're basically celebrating a, well, I think it's like the yeah, it's the 19th, 20th, basically our one-year anniversary here of when this program became formalized. Uh, right now, there are 10 full-blown apprentices in this program that are working on farms and going through the curriculum right now. Uh, the main outcomes that we're looking at for this is for these apprentices to develop skills to operate their dairy and network them with them. And some of the exit opportunities are to be able to either manage one of these dairies or earn equity in cattle so that they could possibly purchase their own dairy or transition into an existing dairy are what we're looking at as some of the potential outcomes. Uh, how did this program get started and get going and really get its legs under it? Again, we had a great relationship. The Department of Workforce Development, the Bureau of Apprenticeship Standards in Wisconsin figured out what we're trying to do and they really helped us out. They were very supportive of it along with some funding out of a sector alliance for a green economy. It was a, a SAGE grant. Uh, within the Bureau. And then the other huge help uh, was the USDA NEFA Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program. We had secured a grant uh, through them to get this whole thing going. So that's really expedited the, the program and has allowed us to take this thing and really try and, and develop a, a serious program here, uh, which we're real excited about and, uh, and, and thankful that this funding and stuff was available, and we hope that it continues to be available. Results of this program, well, let's just pose this. What if we could retain or increase the number of family-sized dairy farms? And I think many of you know the answers to that. And there's a lot of answers to that of what our rural communities could look like, what our food systems could look like if we were to be able to do this. So those are some of the goals and, and some of the results that we're looking for. So with that, I know I'm a hair over, uh, but thanks so much, and I look forward to any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. That was fantastic. And we do have a lot of great questions. Please uh, keep them coming in. Um, but um, let, me, uh, let me start with um, a couple of questions um, for, uh, for Laura since she started us out. Um, so, um, Laura, when you began your presentation, um, you noted that the, the cost of uh, 
per, per cow um, for confinement is very much greater than the cost of a, a managed pasture based cow. So um, where, where does that cost savings come from? It's mostly from feed, from imported feed or? The, it's really um, all of those things. And I've, I've seen farms that have adopted managed grazing partway and haven't been able to achieve that level of cost reduction. So it really um, involves looking at your whole system and um, addressing the feed issue. You know, most maximizing the cheapest source of feed, which is your pasture, and um, focusing on your management of the pasture because you're you're really substituting your management, your brain power for some of those inputs. Um, so we're managing the pasture for the best quality. We're um, incorporating legumes to for that free source of nitrogen. Um, the, a lot of these farms either um, reduce or eliminate the production of uh, corn and annual row crops. So there's a whole set of machinery that goes away or can be downsized or that lasts a lot longer and doesn't need to be replaced. Um, a lot of the these farmers are finding that their um, cows just live longer and they're better, they're healthier. They, they lower their vet bills. They don't, um, they're not having to always raise replacements for their own cows, so they have a, another source of income from the uh, replacement heifers that they can now sell. So it's kind of a, a whole collection of things and um, Unless you kind of adopt the whole system, you're not going to capture all those savings. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> Joe, uh, Jean asks why you you would use artificial insemination at all if you bring in bulls later. Is it for genetic preference? Yes, good question. It's it's for genetic uh, preference. The the bulls that I'm bringing in. Uh, well, actually, the, the bulls I'm AIing to, artificially inseminating to, a lot of it is New Zealand type of genetics that we're bringing in, which uh, they've had, New Zealand is a grazing dairy economy. So they're, their cows are bred a little bit more to utilize pasture more efficiently, uh, to be a little bit more fertile. It seems like they're, like I said, they're breeding back a little bit quicker, and they're a little bit more adapted to our types of grazing systems. Uh, the conventional uh, confined type of a, of a Holstein and some of the, the direction of some of our conventional breeding here, especially in the states, have built a little bit, they've built a big cow, but a, a frail kind of a cow. Um, and there, it, it might be something to say, too, that it's, it's a more of a grain converting type of a cow, too. They do well, on, better on that. And that isn't really what we're looking for. You know, we're just looking for a bit more of a durable, fertile cow. And that's why I'm bringing in, uh, and that's why I do some AI. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, Laura, question for you. Um, Don says some proponents of confinement dairy systems claim lower life cycle greenhouse gas emissions than pasture-based dairies. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, actually I do. Um, I've uh, reviewed some of those, those studies that were done and that have come out in the last few years, and and what I see is a, a pattern of um, utilizing some older data for the comparison. Um, you know, one of the things with these models are that the the data, I mean, the output of the model is only as good as the data that you put in. And several of the papers that have come out have actually compared older information from the 1970s or the 1940s on grazing systems, which just doesn't really apply today. Um, I know one of the big, one of the big studies um, was using milk production from the 1940s for the grazing model, which is unrealistic. <laughs> um, and I guess, you know, the other, that's one example of how the data in uh, doesn't, uh, doesn't give you good results. Um, the yields for the pasture management, uh, the quality, all of those things are factors that um, that weren't really looked at very 
closely for this um, for these studies. And another piece that um, we, a group of us uh, led by Chuck Benbrook at the um, Organic Center, discovered that um, one of the pieces that's really important here is the the life span of the cow, because um, if you look nationally, the um, the average number of lactations for a dairy cow in the U.S. is about 1.7 or 1.8. Um, on these grazing farms, it's more like four or five lactations. And if you think about it, every cow spends two years of her life not producing any milk as she matures and becomes of lactating age. And that's the same no matter whether you get one and a half lactations or five and a half lactations out of that cow. And so if you look look at those same numbers over the lifespan of the animal, you get some very different results. I think there's a lot of, I think the jury is out on this. There's a lot more data that we need to look through and a lot more modeling that needs to be done mm -hmm. before we get an answer. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Joe, what is the cost of an apprenticeship opportunity? Right now, there really isn't much of a cost because we're running underneath, um, you know, this grant and just trying to get these systems in place. Right now, the costs to the apprentice are basically classes, uh, which there aren't there aren't a real lot of classes. Uh, so it's it basic classes and travel to them and books and things like that. Uh, down the road, will there be a fee? I you know I don't know for sure if there will be or not. Um, we're hoping to be able to bring on some industry to help sponsor this program and keep it going. Uh, and and we, have, we have some real good uh, resources that are out there, and, and it's looking pretty promising that, that this will happen. Uh, so right now, not really any huge one. This is just it's an excellent, excellent opportunity because, in fact, you're getting paid. You're on a job uh, while you're going through this. It's, it's earn while you learn kind of a training. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, um, uh, one one of the, our uh, attendees notes that um, uh, in response, Laura, to your the greenhouse gas and carbon footprint, um, he notes that sometimes studies don't include the impacts of the feed inputs, um, which is which can be substantial um, in conventional uh, corn-based ag. Um, Joe, um, I I don't know if um, well. This is a question about the market. So um, Jesse says, let's say I have 100 acres. I put uh, 50 cows on, do an intensive, uh, intensively grazed um, method, and I have a nice, efficient dairy. Now, who, who do I sell my milk to? Oh, well, that's good. You can sell your milk anywhere, you know, the same spot um, you know, where anybody sells it, sell it conventionally. You know, it, it doesn't have to be a value added or anything else like that. It's uh, um, you can sell it and fix it any milk producer. You know, fortunately, and it, and it depends on where the question is coming from. You know, I I do understand that in some parts of the nation there isn't a real good dairy infrastructure that's there. You know, we may take it for granted a little bit that in Wisconsin, you know, I could call tomorrow and have boy a half a dozen, probably ten different milk plants that would come and pick up my milk. Uh, so that's one of the things that we're we're fortunate in Wisconsin, and maybe some other people don't have that fortune. Uh, to be able to do that, but but that's all we'd have to do. Uh, you know, hopefully in time there will be some more outlets or some value added type of markets that we can sell to. Um, but uh, but I'm not an organic producer. Uh, you're probably real close to it, but um, I just graze cows and sell on the conventional market. Mm -hmm. um. Laura, um, in your slides you mentioned that a 250-acre pasture-based dairy can generate an annual income of $225,000. Um, one question is, is that a gross income or is that n net? That would be gross. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, uh, Cole asks you, Joe, if you have a cost estimate on the new milking facility that you, that you made. Um, I, I, uh, the, the brand yeah. new milking facility was mm -hmm. so, uh, it's in that two hundred thousand mark, mark uh, with okay. the renovations and everything to the to the barn. The original one was about seventy thousand. Okay, great. Um, 
um, how how does the uh, income or, and the process work um, in selling off the the male calves? Um, for me, the income the the bulls I mark actually a lot of my bulls uh, bull calves are marketed privately uh, because I am seasonal. We begin freshening the beginning of April, so calves start come in the beginning of April, and we freshen quite a few of them. So you know now, especially between the two farms, there's a few hundred cows here to freshen. Um, well, there's about 250 that will freshen before the first of June. So I'm able to put together groups of 10, 20, and you know plus calves, and so a lot of people you know do like that. So I, I sell a lot of them privately, which will either go you know a lot of them go to you know smaller. Uh, types of farmers who will take them and, and continue feeding them out on whether it be grass or a conventional type of diet or whatever they may be. Um, great. Jesse asks, um, how you get in contact with conventional markets? Is that a, an ag extension agent call or? Um, well, you know, an ag extension agent could help you out with that. Um, you know, uh, take a look and see what milk trucks are going down the road, if you get that's the other, you know, I see a lot of milk trucks throughout the day going past, and you know who, who you know the the buyers are. You know, there's we like I said, we've got a number of cheese plants and stuff around the area here, and and that's who's buying. Um, On another, so yeah. uh, I Go was ahead, Laura. Say, Joe, um, the in most states, it's the State Department of Ag that does the licensing of dairy farms and dairy plants. And um, like here in Wisconsin, we actually have a listing on our website of dairy plants that are operating in the state. So that would be another place to look for information. Great. Mm -hmm. um, are there any studies looking at profit and feeding plans need with uh, intensive pasturing when affected by flooding or by drought? That's an excellent question. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, um, you want this one, Laura? Or I can go ahead. Um, I well, why don't we why don't we both uh, chime in if you've got something to? Um, I'm actually not very aware of anything any research that's been done in the kind of the humid temperate part of the country on um, dairy grazing under drought or flood conditions, but we could. If there's a specific question, we could probably come up with some um, answers. Mm -hmm. And, and basically, you know, when you're in a drought or a natural disaster of some sort where you lose your forage out in the field, um, you know, it, it's basically your budget and your feed costs are going to be whatever purchase feed would be. Um, and, you know, that can be a little bit more than if you were harvesting all your own feed, but depending on how you're set up, there's many times where you can purchase your feed uh, for the same price and sometimes even less uh, than what it would cost you with all the equipment and labor and, and true costs of depreciation uh, to produce yourself. Um, so, you know, I guess that's just how you'd have to back out of that one uh, to take a look and break it out and say, okay, well, cows are still going to eat X amount. What is the cost, uh, you know, per ton of purchased in feed? Uh, it would look a much like you know, a lot of confinement and a lot of the West Coast confinement type of dairies, they operate in that type of budget anyway. Most of the feed is purchased in. Um, you talked a little bit about um, uh, breeds. Um, does it, does it, um, do you want to you talk a little bit more about breeds? That There's a question here about if purebred or crosses, um, do you um, do you prefer great foragers, even if they uh, are slightly lower milk production potential? Um, yeah, you know what I've been doing is uh, I've been just playing crossing, and just when you cross two breeds of cows, you get a certain amount of hybrid vigor out of them, and that is some of the reason for AIing my cows also is to bring in you know that that crossing of them. For instance, I'll take a New Zealand Frisian and cross with a Jersey. Uh, and that first um, cross, you see, you see a lot of hybrid vigor out of it, um, and and they do tend to be typically a pretty durable, pretty efficient animal. Uh, and so, you know, most of my cows, you know, and it's just personally on my place, they're mostly all they're all crossbreds. Uh, you know, I do have still some straight Holsteins and some straight Jerseys here, but you know, not a real lot of them. 
uh, most all of them are, are crosses, just to try and capture a little bit more uh, of a durable, um, more efficient cow if we can. Uh, and they're crossed with everything from, like I said, the jerseys, the milking shorthorns. Um, there's some uh, Norwegian red in there. Um, you know, obviously some Holstein. There's some brown Swiss. You know, all of your your conventional dairy breeds. And then we are starting to bring in some other breeds, like say the New Zealand Frisian, some of the other New Zealand Jersey genetics. Uh, and then you'll see the the Normandy and the Fleckve and and some of those other ones also coming in, uh, because we are ending up with. And it does seem like a little bit of a, a more of a trend is bringing in some of these almost more of a dual purpose animal uh, because they aren't quite as dependent on grain. And as we're looking at this grain price going, you know, just continuing to stay high, uh, there's a lot of profitability there if we can start weaning some of these animals, still get a decent production out of them, uh, but they keep condition on them with a lot less grain, uh, you know, we're, we're finding ourselves better off. Great. Um, and uh, there's a question about for you, Tom. Um, can you can you think back and think what is your what is the biggest mistake you've made? And um, if you can, what is uh, what what do you think your uh, an excellent decision you made uh, that that turned out maybe even better than you expected? Well, well, well. Um, you know, excellent decision. Uh, you know, would be just plain deciding to come back, you know, obviously the first thing is marrying my wife, in case she ever watches this, and it's true. Uh, nice job, <laughs> nice job. <laughs> but anyway, uh, you know, making the choice, you know, to come back and and dairy and starting our own business, you know, that, that is a little bit of a jump. Um, but we were both pretty confident in that decision when we made it. You know, we had pretty secure jobs. We were egg instructors at the same school. Uh, and uh, it, it, that's a great life too. It's a great job. Um, but uh, this is something that we always thought about. So yeah, that was definitely you know probably the best decisions that we made is just that that life decision in general uh, to do. Uh, you know, biggest mistakes. Um, you know, it, I don't know. It, you know, there's a lot of little ones a person makes all the time. You know, and, and maybe you know one thing. You know, just in general is, uh, you know, maybe don't try and don't try and bite off more than you chew. You know, that's something to keep keep mind of and keep mindful of. Um, and you know, in our some of our early career too, you know, uh, physically, you know, you basically figure you can do everything. Uh, you know, I can weld this parlor, I can build it, I can still milk these cows, I can freshen in thirty or forty more cows. Uh, I can feed all these calves and do everything. And, you know, you start to, you know, if you're not careful, you can lose sight of the, the bigger picture and the bigger management picture of it. Uh, so some of these things, it doesn't hurt if you can farm some of this stuff out just so that you get time to come back in and maybe sit down and, and look at numbers or look at big picture goals of where you're going with that whole business. Uh, you know, that's, you need to be able to do that, so that's something to be cautious of, and and that's something I'm probably a bit guilty of, also. <laughs> and, and I just want to reinforce what Joe's saying because the the system works best when you're inputting management, and a lot of people get wrapped up in the day to day running things and raising the crops and working with the animals, and the probably the most important input that you can put in is is managing that system and managing the pastures. So it's easier to hire somebody else to do the physical labor and to spend your time doing the managing. Well, with that sage advice, I would like to thank Laura and Joe. This has uh, been a, a terrific webinar. And if, if you didn't before, you now uh, or weren't before, you're now likely inspired to consider a management intensive uh, uh, pasture dairy operation or advise others to do so if you're not a producer yourself. This webinar uh, is being recorded and will be archived on our site along with the 40 other webinars we've done in the past. Feel free to send others you think would have liked to have heard this panel and take some professional development time yourself and dig through our excellent archives. Visit ngfn.org webinars. <coughs>
This webinar will be up within a few business days. Our webinars are organized into topics, so if you look in the left-hand navigation area, dig into whatever interests you. We offer our MGFN webinars on the third Thursday of each month at 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time, noon 30 Pacific. Uh, Sign-up links are at that same webpage, ngfn.org. Uh, slash webinars. We are taking August off. It's high season everywhere, but check our website and get on our mailing list to find out about our stellar fall lineup. I want to um, let you know that um, the NGFN is on YouTube, on Twitter, on our, we do have our website, ngfn.org, and the Wallace Center is now uh, on Facebook. Come like us, search for Wallace Center at Winrock International. Um, and again, if you haven't already, sign up for our email updates. There's a link on the ngfn.org homepage, or just let us know on the post-webinar survey that Alexis um, mentioned. Uh, we will sign you up there. Uh, and uh, please contact us at any time. Contact at ngfn.org is our email address. The NGFN would like to thank you for your time today. And again, let me encourage you to fill